I'm Adam Rice, and you're listening to Pocket Change, a new podcast that's focused on rethinking conventional economic wisdom through education and conversation about how our monetary system really works. I hope to encourage more economically sound decision making from the ground up. Pocket Change is focused on an economic school of thought known as modern monetary theory, or MMT. Once you understand the basics of MMT, it will likely dramatically change the way you think about public policy. For those of you that are new to the show, I highly recommend listening to the first episode of the podcast with Steve Friedman. In that episode, Steve and I discuss a lot of the basics of MMT that will lay the groundwork for future episodes. Today's episode is the second part of a two-part conversation I had with Bob Hockett, who is a professor at Cornell Law focused on financial institutions. The first episode, we focused on MMT and macroeconomics. And in this episode, we focus more on cryptocurrencies, commercial banks, and kind of the future of how these two things play together. So without further ado, let's get started. I hope you enjoy the episode. So I'm back here with Professor Hockett. He very nicely agreed to do a second episode, and I think this time we're going to focus on cryptocurrencies. Bob, I saw you give an interview on cryptocurrency, and I thought you had a great take on what's going on in the crypto world. And it's kind of tough today sifting through what's real and what's not in the cryptocurrency world. Uh huh. So do you, do you mind giving an overview? You know, I, I really enjoyed what you talked about when you, when you mentioned kind of the wildcat currencies and comparing oh, the cryptocurrencies right. to that. Yeah, sure. No, I'd be happy to talk about that, Adam. And um, thanks, thanks so much for having me on again. It's, it's just it's such great fun to talk to you about this stuff. So, you know, the sort of provisional take that I have on sort of where we are right now, uh, where cryptocurrencies on the one hand, uh, blockchain uh, technologies and other forms of fintech on the other hand uh, are concerned, um, is that you know the, the landscape looks sort of remarkably similar. Uh, to what the landscape looked like in respect of paper uh, currencies uh, back when they were kind of a new thing, uh, at least in the States, uh, back in the uh, 19th century. So a lot of Americans, I think, maybe you know, are not experts, say, on U.S. banking history, and they might just tend to assume that you know, the green dollar bill has been around you know, ever since the Constitution was, was ratified, if not you know, ever since the Declaration of Independence was signed or something, and that, you know, it's just always been issued by the same issuing authority, and things have basically always been more or less as they are now. But that really wasn't the landscape uh, back in the 19th century. Um, for the really the first two thirds uh, of the 19th century, uh, the circulating medium, as it's called in sort of bank parlance or in money parlance, was a kind of paper currency, uh, but these, the paper currencies were all issued by different private banking institutions. They were referred to as banknotes. Um, so, you know, you might have one private bank that's called, I don't know, Pecos Bill Bank or Wild Bill Hickok Bank. You know, another one might be called Allegheny River Bank or, you know, Mohegan Bank or, you know, they'd have these kind of colorful regional names. They were basically kind of local institutions. Uh, and they would issue paper currencies that were, in theory, redeemable uh, for precious metals of one kind or another in most cases, you know, gold coins or silver coins or what have you, at the private banks that issued them. And, of course, you know, they would issue these paper currencies in, in far in excess of whatever specie, as it was called, and that's to say whatever precious metals that they might have uh, on hand. That's essentially the form that uh, so-called fractional reserve banking took uh, in those days. So the thing that sort of interesting, there were a couple things that were kind of interesting about this sort of regime, right? So on the one hand, it's kind of good, right, because the money supply can grow uh, well beyond the supply of gold coins or silver coins or other forms of specie, which was important, right? Because if the money supply is limited by this sort of exogenously given stock of metal, then you've got an inherent drag on the growth of the money supply, which in turn then operates as an inherent drag on the growth of economic activity itself, right? In order to accommodate a growing transaction volume, you need a money supply that itself can grow. Um, you also, of course, need the what amounts to the form of credit extension that is you know, lending in the form of paper currencies. Uh, in order to facilitate rapid growth, right? If, if the only way you could confer temporary command over productive resources to somebody who has a great business idea 
was to get that person, you know, gold coins or silver coins, then, you know, the degree to which uh, various great ideas for new productive enterprises could be realized would be limited uh, by the supply of these gold or silver coins. So by having uh, banks able to issue paper currency in excess of their holdings of these limited supplies of, uh, of silver or gold, you enabled the money supply, at least to some extent, to grow somewhat flexibly in a manner that sort of accommodated growing transaction volume, and you enabled credit extension uh, to grow in a manner that could facilitate more and more you know, productive investment and, and thus more productive enterprise and more growth in the economy and accumulation of, of capital over time. That's the good side of all of this, right? The scary side took sort of two forms as well. One is that you know, as soon as you enable, as soon as the currency um, that's used, the circulating medium, is sort of flexibly growable, then there's always the danger of its being too <laughs> flexibly grown, right? In other words, there's the danger of the notes being issued too far in excess of whatever, quote unquote, is meant to back them up. So you might then have a circumstance in which, you know, let's say Wildcat Bank, let's just call it that since this was called the Wildcat Currency Era, Wildcat Bank, let's say as the name kind of invites you to imagine uh, tends to overissue paper currency. Maybe the standard is to issue currency in the amount of you know a ratio of ten to one. You know, sort of ten dollar notes for every one dollar coin, say. And let's say that's the standard. That's the usual way uh, banks do stuff. Um, there's always a temptation for a bank to do more than that to issue. 15 to 1 or 20 to 1 or 30 to 1. The reason is that it's sort of pure gravy, right, for the bank. I mean, it costs the bank nothing to issue more of these things. And insofar as it does so, it can either, you know, issue the coin, the, 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 the notes to itself and then spend money, it, its own money. Or, of course, it can uh, make more loans that it's going to charge interest for in the form of these uh, paper notes. And so there's always a, a, a kind of a temptation for the banks to overissue. And if they do, that can ultimately lead to a scenario where some people come in one day, you know, to sort of redeem their paper notes for the so-called backup, you know, the gold or what have you. And the bank runs out, you know, of that gold or that silver. And that can then, of course, inspire a run on all of the other banks when everybody realizes, oh, well, these other banks might be doing the same thing. So there was a kind of a boom and bust cycle uh, to which the wildcat banking industry was very much subject uh, during the first two thirds of the uh, of, of the uh, of the century of the 19th century. Uh, the other uh, problem uh, that afflicted the system is sort of closely related to that one, but it's of, of, of sufficiently of sufficient independence. I'm sorry, of sufficient importance in its own right as to warrant uh, discussion as a sort of, you know as a kind of an independent problem, and that is that you know different banks were differently trustworthy when it came to their succumbing or otherwise to this temptation to overissue. So in other words, let's say the standard, uh, let's say the tip, what the pr prevailing standard in the industry is to issue currency uh, as a multiple of 10 of the, you know, the backup that you have in the vault. Wildcat Bank might, you know, issue in a multiple of 100 to 1, but some other bank might issue only in a, you know, a multiple of 20 to 1, and some other bank might do 50 to 1. They're sort of all over the map, you might say, right? And um, over time, these different banks developed, you know, specific reputations for, you know, either over-issuance or, you know, much more sort of prudent issuance. And so some banks were thought of as being more trustworthy and others were thought of as being less trustworthy. Compounding that fact um, or that problem, and it, it was a problem in a way that I'll explain in a moment, but compounding the problem was that the states were, I'm sorry, the banks were all chartered and regulated at that time at the state level. So different states themselves, you know, sort of had different regulatory regimes in place. Some uh, states were very good about regulating their banks. Other states were less so, you know, so some banks not only might be differently, say, tempted uh, to overissue, but might also be differently allowed, right, to overissue, depending on where they were actually chartered. What that meant was that, you know, in the, in the final analysis, we had a very strange kind of Tower of Babel style currency system, where how much a dollar note that you used to pay for something was regarded as being worth 
depended on what bank's name was on that note. And what that meant in turn was that various sellers of various goods or services, let's let's make it goods for the time being just to keep things simple. Let's say you go to a general store and the store sells flour, it sells hammers and nails and other sorts of implements. You know, this is sort of, you know, kind of a very agricultural society still. And so you go to the general store and the store would typically, you know, every week or two would have to update what we, what we call a schedule of currencies that are kept on a kind of clipboard, you know, hanging on the wall behind the cash register. And the schedule would basically just list a bunch of specific banks' notes. And then beside each note name would be a discount rate that applied to it, right? So it might say, okay, a dollar note that is uh, issued by the Wildcat Bank should be counted as being worth only one dime, right? So it says a dollar note, but discount it by 90% and treat it as worth 10 cents. Another dollar note by some somewhat more prudent bank, like say Allegheny Bank or something, might be discounted down to say 75 cents instead of a dollar. And then a sort of an uber safe bank, you know, let's let's just call it, I don't know, a Mother Teresa bank or something, <laughs> highly trustworthy bank, right? Its note might be worth the, the stated par, right? The the one dollar that's actually uh, stated on the on the note itself. And so, you know, if you go into the general store and you've got a bunch of notes that have been issued by different banks, you know, your the seller uh, at the store would have to kind of look at what you know how much you had in connect, you know, that would so, sort of that was issued by each specific bank find out what the discount rate was for each of those notes and then discount appropriately and figure out whether you'd actually handed over enough money in total. Now that's a fairly messy system, right? I mean, it worked, we could kind of muddle through with it, but it's needless to say, it burdens transactions, right? It's very, you know, kind of cumbersome. In fact, you know, if it got bad enough, it wouldn't be that much better than just old fashioned barter or something, right? It just, it's pretty messy sort of system. So, you know, we, we kind of hobbled along uh, with a system of this sort during this so-called wildcat banking era, uh, which is also sometimes referred to by people who aren't down on it as the free banking uh, era. We kind of muddled through. Uh, but by, you know, the early 1860s, uh, this became sort of unsustainable and at the same time, endable. So what happens in the 1860s? Well, as you know, the, the Civil War in the U.S. breaks out. It starts in 1860 itself. And this has sort of two significances um, from the point of view of you know monetary history or U.S. monetary history in any event. The first is that um, it begins to look as though we really can't keep making do with this system of wildcat banks that are all chartered at the state level. We need there to be at least one authority that issues a currency that is the same no matter where you want to spend it, anywhere in the country. Right? We wanted a uniform currency and not just the same unit of account uh, across the country because we had a civil war going on. And so you needed a kind of stable currency system in order for one thing to help maintain some modicum of stability in the national economy, which was now facing considerable destabilizing pressures in the form of the Civil War itself. You know, every time a nasty turn is taken in a battle, and say the Union loses the Battle of Bull Run, for example, well then, you know, suddenly confidence is sort of shaken and, uh, you know, people start worrying about, you know, the future of the Union. And so they're a little more concerned about, you know, the value of currencies as well. And so you've got these sort of sources of instability. So if you could have a somewhat more stable currency, the thought seems to have been, that would at least to some extent kind of help counteract destabilizing forces that the civil war itself, just as a civil war, had sort of unleashed on the land. And then secondly, the other significance here was that the primary uh, source of opposition to an actual national currency, as distinguished from a national unit of account, had always been the southern states, right? They were the ones that were most suspicious of an actual national uh, issuing authority that would issue an, a, a, an actual national currency that would be a sovereign currency. And now, of course, those states were temporarily out of the Union. That was exactly what the Civil War was being fought over, namely their attempt to secede from the Union. So they didn't have any representation in Congress, and so they couldn't obstruct uh, efforts uh, to put in place uh, a true national currency system. So what we did was we passed, or Congress passed, and President Lincoln signed into law in 1863, 
the National Bank Act, um, which is really a kind of a cluster of enactments. But the most important one for our purposes right now was the one that created a new federal charter or what we can call a national charter for a new kind of bank, namely a national bank as distinguished from a state bank or state chartered bank. So these national banks would be chartered by a national chartering authority. They would be operating all over the union, right? You could be a nationally chartered bank in Kansas or in Maine or in ultimately in California or any place, right? Anywhere in the union you could operate. If you had a national charter, then you would basically be subject to, to federal regulations rather than state regulations. And quite importantly here, you would issue exactly the same currency as all of the other national banks. And we called this currency the greenback. And that might sound sort of vaguely familiar. That was the beginning of the green dollar bill right? that we have to this day, even though that's no longer issued by uh, the same authority that it was in the 1860s. And we'll come to that in a moment. But so now the dollar finally becomes, rather than just being a national unit of account, it becomes a bona fide national currency, an actual paper currency, a circulating medium that is issued by an instrumentality of the sovereign public, the federal government itself. And to this day, you can see the vestiges of this or the evidence of this. This act is still good law. And anytime you see the name of a bank where it, it says, say, oh, Bank of America, comma, N-A, whenever you see that N-A after a bank name, that's an abbreviation for National Association. And that means basically that's short for National Banking Association. It just means that that particular bank has a federal banking charter, a national charter. So it's a national bank. Now, the we also created a new regulator at this time. And it's, it's really interesting. This regulator is still with us. But a lot of people don't understand the name that it has because the name doesn't make any sense given the function that this regulator currently performs but it made perfect sense when this regulator was first created by this enactment. It's called the comptroller of the currency. And comptroller is just a sort of archaic legalese term for controller. The idea uh, was that this regulator, to be a special office that was created within the Department of the Treasury, would control the currency. Right? So his or her job would be to sort of oversee the currency and the currency system, basically overseeing the money system. Now, when we did this, we I call this, a, I say that we sort of transition into sort of a new phase of monetary history. I call the first sort of free banking or wildcat banking phase, I'll often refer to this as phase one or stage one. And that's with just, you know, basically free floating currencies that kind of fluctuate in value kind of wildly relative to one another and also relative to the goods and services that they might purchase, right? They rise and fall in value constantly again, relative to one another and to the goods and services that they might purchase. That was stage one. But with this, with the National Bank Act, we moved to stage two. Now we have a single, truly uniform national currency called the greenback. And we have a federal regulator whose job is to sort of oversee the administration of that currency regime. It's a sovereign currency, and it is a stable uh, currency, and all of the national banks are regulated carefully by this comptroller of the currency precisely because it's their job, among other things, to issue the national currency. And in a way, you can kind of analogize then the relation between the comptroller of the currency in this stage two phase uh, on the one hand and the national banks on the other to a sort of franchise uh, arrangement. So if you think about what a franchise is, right? So let's say it's McDonald's. I mean, it's kind of an ugly example, but it, it's a ubiquitous one that everybody will recognize. Basically, you know, every McDonald's restaurant is sort of managed independently by a store manager or a store proprietor or whatever. And that person sort of has control over the operations of that McDonald's restaurant. On the other hand, the McDonald's corporation operates as a sort of standard setter and standard uh, sort of monitor or a monitor of compliance with the standard. So the idea is, you know, yeah, it's true that McDonald's hamburgers are kind of poison. And it's true that, you know, that these are not particularly luxurious sort of institutions when you walk inside of them. But you always know that there's a certain floor under which the quality is not going to fall, right? You can rely on McDonald's hamburgers 
to be poisonous in exactly the same way, where whether the McDonald's restaurant is in California or in Ohio, it's basically going to be poisonous because it has a lot of hydrogenated oils in it, and a bunch of preservatives and so forth. But it's, you know, at least it's not going to have salmonella or whatever, because it is policed by this sort of quality control agency which is the McDonald's Corporation. All right? Now, you can think of the national banks as being like the McDonald's restaurants, and you can think of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, or the OCC, as he's more regularly called or she's more regularly called now, as the sort of McDonald's Corporation, maintaining this sort of quality control. So the OCC was to regulate these banks to make sure that the integrity of the currency, the national currency that they were now issuing, was maintained and that it never fell below a certain quality threshold, a certain quality floor. And so it was a kind of a franchise-like arrangement in that sense. And indeed, our money and financial system has ever since then been kind of like a franchise arrangement in that sense. And we can talk in more detail about the form that the franchise takes now uh, in a bit. But but that's the basic idea behind stage two. So we had a kind of a uniformity now. And so you, you no longer had a world of wildly fluctuating uh, distinct uh, uh, privately issued currencies. I mean, they continued for a while, but they became less and less important as a part of the entire money supply, partly because people learned that the dollar, that the greenback was a, rely- a much more reliable currency than these others were. So why bother with the others? And partly because we taxed the other banks in order to give the uniform national currency a leg up in the early stages. So that was sort of stage two. There was one final step to be taken, I think, to get us into what uh, I refer to as sort of stage three. And that was this. The money supply, while the money itself was now now sort of subject to a kind of quality control regime, and it was also subject to a kind of uniformity maintenance regime, so you had a single uniform currency throughout the whole country that was reliable, the money supply itself was somewhat limited. Uh, it could be grown by letting, for example, the national banks make more loans and to make those loans in the form of currency. And it could be contracted, say, by placing more limits on the lending that those banks could do. And you could do that, but it was a kind of uh, a slow moving, clunky, not altogether graceful or flexible form of money supply control. Because, you know, you, if you were to change the lending regime, you had to do that through legislation or through some sort of regulatory measure that would take some some time to sort of get through and to get approved. Uh, and so it was kind of hard to sort of adjust the money supply in a flexible sort of day-to-day way or even a, a week-to-week way. It was more like month to month at best, or maybe more like six months to six months at best. And that was suboptimal because, you know, ideally you want what is referred to one more term of art here uh, in banking or money parlance as a so-called elastic currency. And that means a currency whose supply can be fine-tuned really quickly, you know, even on a day-to-day basis if need be. The idea here is you want to be able to grow the supply to accommodate growing transaction volume. And you also want to be able to contract the supply in the event that there's less demand for transactions in the real economy and thus a a real threat of inflation that might loom. So you want an elastic currency in that sense. And that comes 50 years later, 50 years after the National Bank Act with the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. And now we get finally, for the first time, a, a real bona fide, fully fledged central bank of the kind that other mature jurisdictions like the, like Great Britain and like Sweden and the Netherlands and France and quite a few other countries that had for centuries by this point. You know, we had had this kind of superstitious dread of central banks. And our first sort of experiment with one, namely the Bank of the U.S., pioneered by Alexander Hamilton when he was Treasury Secretary, was you know always viewed with suspicion by the southern states and was never allowed to become a fully functional central bank and, and indeed was allowed to expire Uh, And so was its successor, uh, the second bank of the U.S. So we finally said, okay, let's bite the bullet and have a real central bank. And then so that was that was when we put in place the the Fed and the Fed became a bona fide, fully fledged, uh, elastic currency provider. So we now moved the greenback from issuance by the Treasury Department or the OCC to issuance by the Fed. 
We kept the OCC as a bank regulator, but now the Fed was what I call the money modulator. It was to modulate the supply of dollars out there, by which I mean it would adjust the supply, right? The money supply on a week to week, and gradually we got to the point of it's doing so on a day to day basis with the various policy instruments at its disposal when it comes to pursuing monetary policy. So that's stage three that comes along 50 years later. Now, here's where I think this becomes interesting from the point of view of the future of cryptocurrency and um, and maybe even fintech more generally. It seems to me pretty clear that you can sort of analogize the stage that we're in right now in the crypto space to what I called stage one in the paper currency space. All right? We've got lots of distinct cryptocurrencies issued by lots of distinct issuers, all of which are subject to very different, if any, uh, regulatory regimes right, of, of any sort, which currencies are sort of regularly fluctuating in value relative to one another and relative to the dollar, and of course, by extension, then relative to various goods and services that they might be used to purchase, right? The most dr- dramatic example, and probably in, in sort of recent memory in people's minds, is you know just Bitcoin itself, right? Which remember shot up to close to twenty thousand dollars per coin uh, at the end of last year, after having you know originally. Um, uh, traded at something, what was it, like 11 cents per coin or something for a while, uh, very, very low. And it's, you know, it has fluctuated ever since, kind of gone up and down. The same is true, if less dramatically, of other cryptocurrencies out there, both when measured relative to the dollar and, again, when rel- when measured relative to Bitcoin or to other cryptocurrencies, you know, to one another. So there's a kind of, you can think of us as being in the midst of a kind of a wildcat phase of cryptocurrency issuance. Now, for the time being, the public can kind of, you know, ignore this or not worry about it too much because none of these coins are really that systemically important at this point, right? I mean, the dollar itself remains, of course, by far the most important uh, currency. And it's it doesn't look like a lot of innocent third parties are apt to be affected by any sort of wild changes in the value of any given cryptocurrency. So if you, if you Adam or I Bob, you know, goes out and buys some Bitcoin because we you know, have been I don't know misled into thinking it's going to be worth twenty five thousand dollars per coin tomorrow, and so we buy it at say twenty thousand or we buy it at fifteen thousand or whatever, and then suddenly it plummets in value. Well, you know, that's just you and me who are affected. I mean, and, and of course, I guess our immediate family or people that uh, we have obligations to. But, but you know, you, as far as I know, um, you, Adam Rice, and I, Bob Hockett, uh, are and am not systemically important in that sense, right? If I go bankrupt or you go bankrupt, I mean, it doesn't really affect the whole world. It doesn't bring down the global economy or even the city of New York's economy. So, you know, it's kind of a, an isolated, it's still a kind of a bit player no pun intended. Bitcoin is sort of a bit player in the currency space, and so are all the other cryptos for now. But my, my guess is that what happens in the long run is that if cryptocurrencies become bigger and become more important, even to the point where they become very commonly used payment media, and they continue nevertheless to sort of fluctuate relatively wildly or erratically or volatilely, Uh, relative to goods and services that they can be used to purchase, and again, relative to one another, and relative to the dollar and other national currencies, probably what will happen, and this might happen anyway in any event for other technological reasons that I suspect we'll get into, but it will probably come to pass that we will at some point very before very long have a kind of crypto dollar, which is basically just to say that the Fed itself will probably come to issue a digital version of or a crypto version of the dollar itself. And my guess is that when we get to that point, once that happens, there's not going to be that much point any longer in buying other kinds of cryptocurrency, right? People, I mean, at least insofar as the reason that people buy cryptocurrencies is to have something that they think is going to retain value and something that they can use as a convenient way of making payments 
in various fora, you know, through their phones or whatever. That can all be done with dollars. A lot of that can be done with dollars even now, of course, with the with other sort of payment systems that are coming online, you know, through phones like Apple Pay and of course before that, PayPal and other sorts of arrangements of this kind, right? But you know, insofar as people want cryptocurrencies because of the sort of the safety features or the confidentiality features that they boast. I can imagine a, a kind of crypto dollar sort of uh, supplanting uh, those cryptocurrencies pretty quickly for many, many purposes. And that would mean that we would have moved then to a kind of stage two in the crypto space, sort of analogous to that that we moved into back in 1863 when we adopted a paper dollar that was truly, that was actually issued by uh, the feds, you know, the federal government, in effect, rather than by wildcat, you know, private banking institutions. So then the next question is, well, what about stage three? And what would that look like? Or what would that be? Well, I think the interesting thing here is that we would probably do stage two and stage three at the same time. And here's what I mean by that. The only reason that there was a 50 year gap between stage two and stage three when it comes to paper currency or the, you know, the, the, the pre crypto dollar, as we know it, is because we came to realize the importance of having a uniform currency before we came to realize the importance of having an elastic currency. And so we adopt the National Bank Act in 1863 in order to get a uniform currency, but we haven't yet become clear with our, to ourselves about the need for an elastic currency. We only figure that out 50 years later after a bunch more financial crises, including those of the 1870s and of 1907. And then we say, oh, okay, we need this thing to be elastic as well as uniform. And we're going to have, you know, we're going to have a central bank do that. So we're going to transfer the administrative function over the currency from the OCC within Treasury over to the Fed. Well, now, again, fast forward to the present. We don't have to relearn that, right? We already know it and we haven't forgotten it because we still have a Fed, right, that is on a daily basis conducting open, conducting open market operations from the New York Fed trading desk right here, you know, right off of Wall Street every morning in order to manage the money supply on a daily basis, all on the basis of reams of data that have been processed the night before, all with a view to what expected or anticipated transaction demand is going to be the following day. So we haven't forgotten that. We're doing it even to this day. So my guess would be that once we adopt a sort of crypto dollar, that crypto dollar will be administered by the Fed, and it will be flexibly or elastically administered by the Fed in the same way that the dollar as we presently find it is administered. So stage two and stage three, in other words, will be reached at the same time. Now, I think that's going to be kind of cool when we do it because it offers really some kind of interesting prospects. And the one that I, I you know, I, I don't want to be too long-winded, so I'll just mention this one and then sort of pause for a second to see what, what more questions uh, it might be fun to sort of address. But I'll, I'll leave the present discussion on this note. One really cool prospect, I think, that's offered by the prospect of a crypto dollar that's administered by the Fed is it would be very easy, technologically speaking, for the Fed, when it does this, you know, when we move to that kind of system, to open up in the name of every citizen of the United States what we can call citizen accounts or citizen Fed accounts or Fed citizen accounts. I've got a big piece coming out on this that uh, we can talk about later if you like that's called the citizen's ledger. And the idea is that every citizen will have an account with the Fed. And when the Fed wants to con you know, expand or grow the money supply, it will now have a new tool at its disposal. Instead of working through private banks that essentially operate as middlemen between the Fed on the one hand and citizens who have to borrow from those private banks on the other hand, the Fed could directly credit our citizen accounts as a way of injecting more money into the economy to encourage or to foment more growth, say during a downturn or during a recession. Of course, as you know, after the 2008 crash, there was a lot of talk for a while about helicopter money or helicopter drops. And the Fed, in effect, did this, but it did it by dropping the money, so to speak, on private banking institutions and then praying that those private banks would lend more since they had more to lend. And of course, they didn't really do that much of that lending. And that's why we got the so-called pushing on a string problem 
And instead, those banks would just speculate with the money, you know, in commodity markets and other uh, secondary markets. But imagine if the Fed had been able to give the money directly to citizens who needed it because they were hurting after the crash. Well, they would have spent the money and that would have provided an immense monetary stimulus to the economy. And the only reason the Fed couldn't do that before is that they just didn't have the institutional infrastructure to do it. We just didn't have a payment system that had the requisite network capacities, the, 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 the sort of the wiring, as it were. We didn't have citizen accounts. But if we put in place a system of these citizen accounts, we could directly credit citizen accounts when we wanted to boost the money supply in a way that actually affects spending decisions and consumption. And then we could also do the reverse when we have to sort of do a, a kind of basically try to tap down uh, expenditure activity to slow the economy down if it looks to be overheating and, and, and moving into kind of bubble territory. The easiest way to do this would be to offer interest on these Fed accounts. And then the Fed could basically just raise the interest rates on those accounts, which would then give you, Adam and me, Bob, an incentive to keep more money in those accounts and spend less for a while at least during you know a period when the Fed is thinking it's a good idea to kind of trim back on spending activity because the economy is overheating. So monetary policy, I think, would be much more directly effectuated and hence much more effective and not, not to mention much more egalitarian, right? Much more good for ordinary citizens than just for big shot bankers and shareholders and big banks than what we currently have. And that would be much easier to do with a sort of a system of a kind of a, blo- a sort of a blockchain payment system that the Fed might uh, administer um, that in- includes hookups to individual citizen accounts that can be directly credited by uh, the Fed and that can be directly paid interest on uh, by the Fed, uh, depending on what monetary policy uh, it wants to pursue at a given time, you know, expansionary or contractionary. So that's, I think, where we're ultimately probably headed, um, Adam. I might be wrong, um, but if past is prologue and if history is in any way a a kind of a hint as to what we might expect in the future, then I think it, I might be on good ground here, you know, in predicting this. A few follow-ups to that. How do the central bank insiders, how do they feel about cryptocurrency? And is this something that they're currently working on incorporating or is that down the road? They seem to be uh, working on it pretty vigorously now. And, and kind of as you might expect, There was a kind of growth curve, you might say, that was sort of followed or the path path sort of followed a a kind of um, hyperbolic curve. So what I mean by that is, you know, sort of slow at first to sort of take it up You say, go back, say, to 2011 or 2012, 2013. Not much talk about it uh, among central bankers, as far as I am aware, at least. Not much writing about it. You know, not much, you know, kind of mild interest, you might say, circa 2013. Uh, Then move forward to, say, 2014, 2015. Some people, some of the personnel in some of the research departments of some of the regional Fed banks, at least, notably St. Louis, but also New York Fed, some of the other regional Feds, some of them begin to sort of look into it to sort of figure out what it is, uh, what is this phenomenon, what sorts of risks might this new phenomenon pose to financial stability, what kinds of opportunities might it pose. And then there's a kind of a gradual, almost a kind of geometric growth in interest where you see more and more and more than sort of research, uh, sort of personnel in the research departments of the regional Fed banks taking this up so that by 2016, 2017 here in the States, there's quite a bit of it going on. Other central banks, interestingly enough, in other parts of the world were much quicker uh, out of the gates on this. The Bank of England is kind of famously uh, ahead of the curve on this, was, you know, was putting out really interesting research papers on the promise of, you know, digital fiat currencies, even as early as 2014, 2015. And major policy addresses were being uh, delivered uh, by personnel uh, over the Bank of England. And then finally, some of the smaller uh, monetary authorities that are kind of like the functional equivalent of central banks in some smaller jurisdictions out there have already moved to sort of full on uh, cryptocurrency, sort of digital fiat cryptocurrency regimes. Uh, Singapore, uh, in particular, is kind of ahead of the pack on this. They're already doing this. Bank of England is is sort of ahead on the research, is way up, you know, on the research curve. But Singapore is even way up on the implementation curve, you might say. So I, I think that there's increasing uh, interest in this. It's growing pretty fast. And, you know, this big uh, conference that my 
ACE uh, doctoral student, Rowan Gray, and I co-organized over on the Cornell Tech campus uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, was explicitly designed uh, to bring together uh, central bankers who are working in this space with industry folk who are working in the space. It was sort of the biggest conference of its kind uh, thus far, and it turned out to be quite a success. We had I think at least 40 or 50 central bankers from all over the world, including here in the U.S., and then probably another 50 to 70 industry uh, representatives present as well, all sort of exchanging ideas, comparing notes, um, and and trying to visualize the future together and how to optimize that future. So I, I think it's getting pretty big now among central bankers. Also, I didn't realize that the Fed could not directly credit consumer accounts at this point. Because it, distinct from, you know, I, I guess thinking about social security, for example, how does cryptocurrency enable something different than social security? Well, uh, primarily what would probably happen there, so, so currently, of course, that's, that is a whole system in its own right where uh, you receive your benefits from the, from the social security administration. Um, And, of course, you receive them in the form of typically of a crediting of an account, although you don't have to do it that way, right? You can elect to receive a check that you then go and deposit in your own account. But you can also arrange for, you know, so-called direct deposit of your Social Security benefits. I mean, neither you nor I um, have you know, direct experience with that yet, because we're just, we're not old enough. But, you know, even if nothing were to change from, you know, sort of the current environment, you and I would be able to get, uh, you know, uh, some some years down, some decades down the road, you know, direct deposit from the Social Security Administration or just receive checks that we deposited. Um, what, all that crypto would do, let's say we go to a crypto dollar, all that that would change here would be, you know, the form that direct deposit took, or maybe even the form that receiving a check would take would perhaps be an electronic form or crypto form or something like that. On the other hand, if we actually got to a system of Fed administered accounts, right, where the Fed itself is administering basically bank accounts that everybody has with them that you can make payments out of and uh, receive payments into, well, then you could very well imagine are basically just rerouting the social security payments to Fed accounts, right? So you probably, you can imagine probably the easiest thing to do would be to have a system of direct deposit where the direct depositing would be done to your Fed account, each individual's Fed account. And the same would probably happen, like, let's say, for example, you, you know, you do your, you fill out your income tax forms each April and you know you turn them in and it turns out that you are owed uh, a refund maybe because you've had too many deductions taken right so you qualify for a refund uh, from the irs from the internal revenue revenue service maybe instead of getting a check uh, from the irs which is what i do i always end up overpaying my taxes and then i get a big check from the irs every spring instead of getting that check right maybe what would happen would be that the irs would just directly credit my Fed account uh, with my uh, IRS refund. You might imagine just that would become like the default uh, option for everybody, and you would have a right to opt out if you preferred to have a private bank account too, and you preferred to have, you know, I don't know, direct deposit of your IRS refunds or your Social Security checks or whatever made into that private account. You could opt for that, but the default position would be that, you know, unless you ask for something different, it just automatically goes to your Fed account. This would also be kind of cool because you, you would no longer have people who are unbanked, right? As you know, uh, estimates vary, but the, I think the dominant estimate out there is that somewhere as much as somewhere, somewhere close to 20% of Americans are unbanked, right? And now no, nobody would be unbanked. The account would be opened in your name at birth. And, you know, if we decided one day to adopt something like, you know, baby bonds or what were sometimes called, uh, you know, some of those proposals that were made in the late 90s to, you know, directly credit every citizen at birth with, you know, $500 or something that might grow gradually over time so that by the time people turn 18, they have a, a nice little nest egg that they can use to fund part of their education or to start a business or something. You could imagine using those accounts for that purpose as well. But everybody would basically have. Uh, a bank transaction account into which they could receive monies and out of which they could make payments. 
in this world of, you know, let's say there is a Fed coin and let's say there are public bank accounts for everybody, mm-hmm. what does this mean for the commercial banks? It would significantly diminish, I think, their, uh, the, that portion of a transaction account activity that they currently account for. So there would still be, presumably, transaction accounts uh, maintained by private banks. People would presumably, at least in some cases, still have, you know, maintain checking accounts with those banks. And those banks would continue to engage in lending activity. And that lending activity might be, to some extent, limited as a sort of a multiple both of capital that they can attract in the form of shareholder equity and their total liabilities might be limited to a multiple of the deposits that they were able to attract by offering interest and what have you. But the role would be significantly diminished. And I think that would be actually a healthy thing because when you think about it, these are actually two separate functions that don't have to be linked, right? So, you know, in a lot of my work of, say, three, four years ago, and even even longer ago. I mean, I'd say a lot of the work I was doing from about 10 years ago until about maybe two or three years ago, a lot of that work was devoted to debunking what I call the um, intermediated scarce private capital myth, or what we could call for shorthand, just the intermediation myth. So this myth is that, you know, basically the way what banks do is they take deposits from people like you and me, and then they lend that money out, you know, to other borrowers that, that have need of uh, funds. And, you know, they, they either limit it on a one-to-one, ba- I mean, they either lend it on a one-to-one basis, you know, $1 in, $1 out, or, you know, somewhat more sophisticated people will say, well, the fractional reserve banks basically lend it out in a multiple, say 10 to one or whatever of the deposits. But neither of those views is correct, strictly speaking. Uh, a bank does not need deposits to make loans, right? Banks can simply make loans even without any deposits at all. And it's more true to say that the, the loans make the deposits than it is to say that the deposits make the loans. Uh, so the, the lending function uh, is a completely severable function from the deposit taking function. The deposit taking function for its part is just basically, you know, holding your money for safekeeping. It's like a kind of a bailment service. And, you know, as you probably noticed, banks hardly pay anything in the way of interest on those accounts. And that itself sort of signifies or sort of is a tip off to you how little they actually need those deposits to do what they do to make money, right? I mean, those deposits come in handy for them. They like having them, which is why they advertise to you to get you to make deposits there, and which is why they'll offer a kind of very small, nominal, minimal interest rate on them to try to attract you. But, you know, the real money that they make off of that is by basically charging you fees when you do it. So, you know, I don't think it would be a bad thing to say, okay, look, for most purposes that people maintain deposits, namely a place where you can keep your money safely, and secondly, a place where you know to have an account out of which you can make payments, you don't need private banks to do that. Uh, and indeed, it's even kind of dysfunctional to have profit motive inspired institutions doing that. It's really a public utility. I think, you know, deposit taking and payment services offering. So for those purposes, I think it's actually better to take that function away from those private banks, or at least to steer a lot of it away and have it be offered by a public instrumentality, since it is in the final analysis, a kind of public utility. So I think that's the, I think that's the world that we ought to strive uh, for. Did you, did you work on the recent paper with Morgan Ricks? That's an interesting story. Uh, So there's a a number of us, a group of us have been sort of talking about this kind of possibility for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, Morgan is part of that group. I'm part of that group. Uh, Lev Maynand, who's another author on that particular paper, uh, has also been part of this group. Um, Lev and I in particular have been talking about this stuff for about three years or four years now. Uh, we have this kind of cute arrangement where we we basically have lunch once a week uh, downtown uh, over on Stone Street uh, here in Lower Manhattan. Lev and I have been talking about this stuff for ages. Uh, Morgan and I have been talking about this stuff for ages as well. Sometimes, you know, more through email than through personal 
a meeting because we live in different places, whereas Liv and I, Lev and I live in the same place. But so, yeah, well, this has been sort of in the air among a lot of us for quite some time, or a, a number of us. Uh, another person who, of course, has been uh, thinking about this a lot and talking with me about this for a long time is Rowan Gray, who I mentioned earlier, who put out a really nice piece on you know, the future prospects of digital fiat currencies. I'd say there are two fundamental differences, let's say, between this the, the proposal in the form that Lev and, and Morgan and, and John Crawford are making it and the form in which I'm going to make it or perhaps my uh, uh, frequent co-author, Soli uh, Omarova, and I might make it. And in a way, it sort of tracks a distinction between another big paper that Sally and I did on the one hand and a bunch of papers that Morgan did on the other hand. In a word, the difference is this. Morgan tends to focus more on the liability side of the balance sheet of banking institutions and the banking industry. And I and my sort of like-minded fellows tend to look more at the asset side of the balance sheet. So what Morgan is most concerned with is what he calls panic proofing. He's most concerned with the liquidity strains under which a money issuing institution like a bank on the liability side of the balance sheet can kind of come under, right? He's worried about the possibility of overissuance of money or under-regulation of institutions that issue money on the liability side of the balance sheet in the form of transaction accounts. And most of the proposals then that he suggests, uh, including that that he makes in his little book called The Money Problem, which basically just binds together some articles that he wrote back from around 2012 through uh, 2016, uh, are concerned with this so-called panic proofing and with licensing institutions that issue the functional equivalent of transaction accounts that are like bank deposits, right? So he looks at, you know, repo markets and other sec- subsectors of the so-called shadow banking sector and looks at the, the, the sort of panic proneness of those institutions that is a kind of functional equivalent to the panic proneness that banks were subject to before the advent of deposit insurance, right? Now, I think that's a a good thing to look at, and I think it's fair enough to make proposals that are sort of focused on that. And indeed, uh, his and Lev's and uh, John's version of a sort of Fed account proposal is largely about that as well, as they admit in the paper, as they're sort of, you know, very refreshingly forthright about, just saying that, look, Let's take that function out of the private banking sector, or at least take a big part of it out of that sector, put it, uh, you know, give it to the Fed, and then we remove that source of panic proneness or of potential liquidity crisis, you know, from the banking sector uh, altogether. Now, again, I think that's fine. I think that's that's a perfectly worthwhile aim, but I think it's short sighted to 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 view that as the primary aim. I think the primary aim ought to look, uh, actually ought to be understood and framed by reference to the asset side of the balance sheet. In other words, I think the real concern is the overissuance of credit by private institutions, by private financial institutions, some of which are banks, some of which are shadow banks, and some of which are not even shadow banks. They're just basically investment banks that might or might not be engaging in shadow banking. They might just maintain margin accounts on behalf of certain clients who are using their margin accounts to speculate on securities uh, in the capital markets. It can be any kind of credit extending at all. As long as that credit extending, and that's, of course, the asset side of the balance sheet, as long as that is accommodated by the Fed, which, of course, it is now throughout the financial system, that's where the real danger lies, because the over-issuance of credit does multiple things, causes multiple harms. One is it is itself what gives rise to the danger of panic on the liability side of the balance sheet in the first place. It is also what gives rise to asset price bubbles and busts, which of course ultimately bring panic to the liability side of the balance sheet, but that also cause untold havoc throughout the financial system and throughout the macro economy, even apart from any crashes that might occur on the liability side of the balance sheet, right? I mean, if you think of it, think about it. Just think in terms of what happened to the uh, in the housing markets uh, in the lead up to two thousand eight. Even if there had not been a liquidity crunch, 
as occurred in 2008 with the falling of some of the larger institutions like the Lehman Brothers, of course, and with the, the sort of drain of confidence from other institutions like AIG and the like, even if there hadn't been that particular crunch, the fact remains that credit had been overissued for the purchasing of homes and for the purchasing of mortgage-related financial assets, mortgage-backed securities, credit default swaps, you name it, with the result that once those assets dropped in value, once the credit ran dry and those assets plummeted, you suddenly had lots and lots of bankrupt institutions that had basically overextended credit, and you had lots of people who now were left holding assets, be they homes or uh, mortgage-backed securities or other uh, financial assets whose values were tied to homes, suddenly were left holding these things that, that they owed more on than those things were now worth. I would sort of shorthand describe this as you had as by saying you had lots of people who were left owe, owing more than they owned. Now, that's all asset side activity, right? That's all overextension of credit on the asset side of the balance sheet. And it seems to me that that's where the real problem lies. That's what you really want to be addressing. And a way to address this, one way to address this would be to say, okay, banks, um, you are going to be limited when it comes to how much credit extending you can do, partly by reference to how much you can attract in the way of deposits and shareholder equity. But you're going to be inherently limited as to how much you can attract in the form of such deposits because we now have a public option available when it comes to bank accounts. People, act, Lots of people will keep lots of or most of or all of their monies, their, you know, their disposable monies, uh, in their Fed accounts. And so that itself is going to limit right, the amount of the kind of lending that you can do, the kind of credit extending you can do. Furthermore, what we might do is say um, – you banks, instead of, or in order to have, uh, in order to be able to get your own accounts, your own Fed Reserve accounts credited with the Fed, you're going to have to convey certain assets, right, in return for those to the Fed, right? The Fed is monetizing assets that are generated by uh, private banking institutions in their lending activities, right? This is part of what the discount regime does. This is part of what the discount window, I should say, does. It's part of what Section 372 of the Federal Reserve Act does. One thing, another thing we can do is we can say, look, you have to hold some of your assets uh, in the form of uh, securities that are issued by, let's say, a new public investment entity uh, that I call uh, uh, a National um, Investment Authority, uh, or NIA for short, which would basically be like a kind of a contemporary version of the old Reconstruction Finance Corporation that basically um, uh, allocates uh, uh, federal credit, uh, and also uh, jump starts or encourages the allocation of private credit to public infrastructure projects and other sorts of public uh, goods. We might say that a greater part of or a significant part of the, your, the Federal Reserve accounts that uh, private banks maintain would be, you know, the, the offsets to those would be assets held in the form of these issuances of this national investment authority and the, the sort of the, the the sort of the the end product of this would be a, a financial system that involves the public sector in more allocation activity than we currently find so that's not to say you know completely displace private credit allocation it's just to say give a larger role of this to the public sector because i think that the arrangements that we have currently that basically place almost all, pri all uh, credit allocation decisions within the hands of private sector entities that are really just trying to maximize profits and to do so in sort of the short term to sort of render it a more sort of functional regime by giving the public once again a larger role in some of that allocation, just as was the case with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in the 1930s and the 1940s, and has continued to be the case with some of the offspring of the RFC, uh, notably uh, Fannie and Freddie. Uh, before they were privatized, you know, back in the 1950s, 1960s, 
and even in the 1970s and 1980s. I mean, people forget that Fannie and Freddie were basically public institutions until we converted them to shareholder ownership in the 1990s. And they were originally subsidiaries of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was a gigantic public investment authority that we put into place during the New Deal uh, era in order to reconstruct our economy in a time when private financial institutions simply could not be relied on to do that. And just one last point on this, um, again, because the RFC has been unfortunately forgotten, but it's a really important piece of our history. You know, during its heyday in the 30s and 40s, uh, it was by far the largest financial institution in the world. Uh, Its balance sheet dwarfed uh, those of all of the Wall Street um, uh, institutions combined. Uh, and it made a, a, an astonishingly, an astonishing, it had, there was sort of an astonishing range of different investments it made. Investments as small as $20 loans to African American barbershops in California, to as large as, you know, multi million dollar uh, rural electrification projects and other kinds of uh, infrastructure projects in the Southeast and other parts of the country. And, you know, I don't think we necessarily have to go as far as a, a reinstituting something quite as large relative to the rest of the financial system as the RFC was. But I'd say if we you know, return to a, a, sta- a, a status quo that was where it was, say, maybe half or two-thirds the size relative to the, the rest of the financial system of the RFC, that would probably be all to the good. Well, Bob, I think that's a good place to leave it. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you joining again. And I'm sure my listeners will enjoy this. Oh, thank you so much, Adam. This is uh, once again just great, great fun to talk about. Very stimulating. I love, I love the questions that you ask and the, the thoughts that you have on this stuff too. And uh, uh, anytime, uh, happy to do it again uh, in future. Um, one thing's for sure: uh, there will be lots of new developments um, in the coming months and coming years. So, plenty to talk about. Uh, looking forward as well. Definitely. Thanks again, Bob. All right, my friend. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, that wraps up my two-part conversation with Bob Hockett. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in learning more about MMT, feel free to follow me on Twitter at Adam A. Rice and subscribe to this podcast. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter at Pocket Change MMT and the Facebook page is just Pocket Change Podcast. If you are interested in following Bob, his handle is RCH371 on Twitter. And... Thank you for listening, as always.